It's been almost a year since my last upcoming MMO video, so I think it's about time we take a look at what's in the pipeline. Now I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say that things in the MMO space have been pretty slow for the last few years. We've had our fingers burned a few too many times recently and it's made us a bit of a cynical bunch. Though, that being said, this channel is about focusing on the positive and there are some games in development that I'm hoping can deliver for us. I have no intention of creating some kind of exhaustive list of this video, instead I'm going to be highlighting the 5 games that I personally think might be worth looking into. If the game you're most excited about isn't on the list, it's not because I think it sucks, it just really isn't my thing. However, to try and avoid too much bias, I've included a quickfire section at the end that lists some additional MMOs. These will be the ones that we just don't have a great deal of information on right now, or that I'm probably not going to play myself, but I still think that you might be interested. One final thing to note is that we're going to focus on the thing that makes each of these games unique, rather than simply listing their features. I already have overview videos for a lot of these games that will give you that kind of detail. Anyway, I just wanted to set some expectations for the video before diving in. So let's start with the first game on our list, Crowfall. Crowfall is a PvP focused game that's actually doing something rather unique in the MMO space. They're essentially mixing an MMO with a strategy game that's going to be back to what they've described as a Game of Thrones style political system. They've even coined a new term for this type of game and they're calling it a Throne War Simulator. The game features campaigns that will span several months at a time, in which factions will fight for control of dynamically created worlds that will slowly decay and be destroyed over time. The destruction of a world will signal the beginning of a fresh campaign, and this ensures that one faction doesn't become too dominant and basically becomes invincible. Obviously this wouldn't be much of an MMO if there weren't some persistent areas in the game as well, and these are called Eternal Kingdoms. This is where you'll be able to do stuff in between campaigns like store items and own player housing. As a traditional leveling system wouldn't really work within the confines of these campaigns, essentially you'd end up either having to level up again every single campaign, or you'd end up having a big mismatch of levels that'd make the whole thing feel unbalanced. So rather than opting for this traditional vertical progression system, instead they've gone for a horizontal one. This could be roughly compared to starting an endgame in a more traditional MMO, but hopefully with a less steep learning curve. Crowfall is very much a PvP MMO as it's based on player versus player campaigns that you can actually win or lose. Campaigns definitely have a sandbox feel to them where there's a player driven economy and you can control different territories and even go as far as levying taxes on other players. As you can imagine, these territories are going to be hotly contested and you can expect to see some pretty cool large scale battles and castle sieges. They originally had a soft launch plan for 2018, but it was clear that the game wouldn't be ready, so they've done the right thing and pushed it back to 2019. I say this is the right thing to do because most MMOs just don't recover from a bad launch. The only exceptions seem to be the ones that have huge resources behind them, like ESO and Final Fantasy XIV. If you want more detail on Crowfall, then I'll link my overview video in the description down below. Moving on to Ashes of Creation. Some of the things that immediately drew me to this game were the stunning visuals as well as the promise of both solid PV and PvP experiences. In my opinion, there are too many games out there that focus on only one or the other, and if nothing else, it looks like Ashes could be a solid all-rounder. However, I did promise to talk about unique features, and what I feel is unique about Ashes of Creation is the node system. This is where players can actually build up a region of the world through their own actions. As a node levels up, new features will start to appear. First of all, you might have a small and humble base camp, but as the node continues to advance, it might eventually become a large city or a castle. And it's not just the settlement itself that's dynamic. The growth of the settlement, as well as the actions of the players, will also unlock new quests, dungeons, and resources in the surrounding area. A really cool thing about this system is that the nodes won't follow the same linear progression each time. Instead, their evolution will be dependent on player decisions and player-driven events. The direction of a node could be shaped by how players respond to enemy threats in the region, how they decide to utilize the natural resources of the surrounding area, or simply certain decisions that they make during quests that will be unlocked as the node progresses. Another factor that's going to influence the development of nodes is PvP. Ashes of Creation takes place in a world at war, and if you want to maintain ownership of a particular node, then you're going to have to fight for it, especially if it's on the frontier. Trading between these nodes also forms an important part of the player-driven economy. You can hire guarded caravans to transport your goods between towns and cities in order to make a profit, but you're going to have to be wary of other players who may be eager to steal your goods and take that profit for themselves. 
Oh, and one final note on the node system is that you can not only own, but also build player housing. Players who snatch up real estate when a node's in its early stages are going to reap the rewards if it one day becomes a city, and their property is going to skyrocket in value. This whole node system seems incredibly ambitious, but if they can pull it off, it could be fantastic. What we've looked at here are just some very early examples of how constantly evolving settlements that are driven by player actions could impact gameplay. As of right now, Ashes of Creation is currently in alpha testing, and we don't have a confirmed release date at the moment, but it's probably safe to say that it's a while off yet. Again, I have a much more detailed video on Ashes of Creation that I'll link in the description down below. Anyway, let's move on and talk about Chronicles of Illyria. Chronicles of Illyria is a very unique proposition in the MMO space, so I'm probably going to have to highlight a few features to give you an idea of it. Let's start with the nobility system. Essentially, there's going to be a political hierarchy in place in Chronicles of Illyria. Players are going to be able to hold positions such as Baron, Duke, Duchess, Lord, and even King or Queen. And rather than these just being meaningless vanity titles, players are actually going to control vast areas of the world and the people in it. This extends to entire kingdoms in the case of kings or queens. Peasants will answer to barons, barons will answer to dukes, and dukes will answer to kings, and basically it's like a role player's dream. I will admit that's not my kind of thing, but it does sound very interesting. It looks like at launch these titles are going to go to the backers of the game, but don't worry, it looks like they can lose them very easily. And that is essentially because of the next system I want to talk about, and that is aging and dying. The game actually features several different forms of what you could usually consider dying in an MMO. Firstly, there's incapacitation. This is where you're essentially knocked out and you can be revived. Secondly, there's spirit walking, which will occur if someone implements a killing blow when you're incapacitated. However, the more often you spirit walk, the more difficult it's going to become to get to your body. Eventually, you won't actually be able to make the distance, and then you're going to die permanently. Interestingly, the more politically powerful your character is, the faster they'll die. You can also die from old age, and aging is going to actually affect your character's physical appearance. By the end of your life, you will genuinely look like an old person. By the way, if you're wondering, the estimated lifespan of a character is around 12 months in real time. However, when you die, there is a form of continuity, and that is in the soul system. You can use your soul to create a new playable character, who's going to benefit from some of the traits of their predecessor. This is going to allow them to do stuff like learn certain skills a lot faster. You're even able to have children in the game, so you could choose to pass your soul onto one of your own kin, thus continuing the legacy of your character. This brings us on to the third and final system I want to talk about in Chronicles of Illyria, and that is the family system. Rather than picking a race and class, you're going to pick a family. And instead of starting in a standard NPC starter town, you're actually going to grow up where that family is based in the world. You're actually going to have stats and abilities based on your family, and perhaps most interestingly, you're actually going to look like them. This means that people could identify which family you're from in the world just by looking at you, and that's a pretty cool feature that I haven't seen implemented anywhere else. Overall, Chronicles of Valyria looks incredibly ambitious, perhaps worryingly ambitious. On paper, it could be groundbreaking, but it's being developed by a fairly small team, and I don't know how much of this can actually become a reality, but I really, really hope it can. The website says that the launch is projected for 2019, but I'm not sure if that's current or if they're going to meet that goal. As of the previous video, I've got a more detailed overview of Chronicles of Valyria, and I'll link the video down below. Moving on to Camelot Unchained. The most important thing to understand about Camelot Unchained is that it's a game that revolves entirely around an ongoing war between three realms. As a player, you're going to pick a realm when you first make your character, and from that point onwards, everything you're going to do is going to in some way contribute towards your realm's war effort. It could be crafting equipment, gathering much needed resources, building fortifications, fighting other players, or any number of other activities. At the end of every day, you'll receive credit for your contributions towards the war effort, rather than being rewarded on a task-by-task -task basis like in most other MMOs. You're never going to be able to fight against another player within your realm, and there's going to be no instance PvP. The focus is going to be entirely on a massive open world realm war. I really can't emphasize this point enough, as literally every decision that the development team are making is made with this tri-realm dynamic in mind, and their intention is for these PvP battles to be enormous. They've even gone as far as developing their own purpose-built game engine that's actually capable to deal with these massive battles. The world's made up of islands that will actually physically join with the conquering faction's mainland once they've been taken, and subsequently they'll drift away once they've been lost. Each area is going to have some form of strategic importance in one way or another. It might be the island's resources, its defensive potential, or even just its location. 
As you can probably tell, much like with Crowfall, this is a very PvP focused game. There is going to be PvE in the game, but it's not going to be that typical theme park based MMO PvE that we're also used to. NPCs are generally going to serve some kind of purpose that contributes towards PvP, as is crafting and gathering and anything else that you might take part in in PvE. So you could actually contribute towards your realm success without actually ever engaging in PvP, but I think that's going to be a very niche thing, and it's certainly not something I'd find much enjoyment in. There's also a fairly unique combat system in the game. Rather than just targeting an enemy player and casting various abilities, you'll actually be able to aim your abilities at different body parts in order to exploit weakness. So for example, if you notice your enemy isn't wearing a helmet, then it might make sense to punch him in the face. How this very precise hand-to-hand -hand combat is going to fit in with this much wider large-scale PvP battle is yet to be seen, but I feel like it's a feature that could be really interesting to keep an eye on. Anyway, Camelot Unchained just went into beta testing, so it's actually further along than the other titles we've talked about so far. I do have a more detailed video on Camelot Unchained, and as always, I'll put it in the description down below. The next game on our list is probably the one that I'm most excited for, and that is Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. The developers of Pantheon have said that they're picking up where the classic MMO left off. They believe that a lot of the things that made MMOs special back in the early days have been kind of lost or at least muddied along the way. So rather than focusing on high-end graphics or fancy action combat, the gameplay tends to focus on community building. They're looking to achieve this in a number of different ways. Firstly, they're making challenging content that requires you to work with other players to get through it, and not just in dungeons, but in the open world as well. And secondly, they're taking out a lot of the convenience features that basically allow you to skip social interaction. I'm talking about things like group finders that teleport you directly into the dungeon, and then if you leave, you can just join another group of players with pretty much no consequence. While these features are massive time savers, what they don't do is teach you to appreciate other players. That aspect of community building around group content feels a lot weaker in modern MMOs than it used to. It's certainly not going to be for everyone, they're not even trying to pretend that this game is for everyone, but for those people who love building friendships around group content and MMOs, then this could be a really good fit for you. Another cool thing about Pantheon is that the challenge that it's promising isn't exclusive to endgame content. I always find it quite amusing when people say how challenging MMOs used to be when they're in fact talking about endgame content. What we did have back then however was far more challenging leveling content and Pantheon is promising to bring that back. Also in place of a traditional questing system, Pantheon's going to utilise something called the perception system. The whole intention with this is to make questing far more thought provoking and immersive. Quests in Pantheon aren't going to be anywhere near as obvious as NPCs with big yellow exclamation marks over their heads. Instead you're going to have to interpret far more subtle signs if you want to be led on a particular adventure. This kind of system really immerses you in the world as you're actually exploring and taking note of different features rather than just following a sparkly line. One thing I would say about Pantheon is that we have to be very careful not to limit it with statements such as it's pure old school or that it's not for snowflakes or the kind of bullshit that Wildstar basically did. The developers have very clearly stated that they want to bring the best of old school and merge it with some new innovative features. That's why they say they're picking up where the classic MMO left off, not dragging us right back to it. Anyway, like I said, Pantheon is still very much in the making and we won't be seeing a release anytime soon. If you want to know a little more about the game, then you can check out my more detailed overview, which I'll link down below. There are of course plenty of other MMOs in development, so we're going to finish this video off with a quick fire round where we're going to list MMOs that are either so early in development that we don't have any details at all, or that I'm just not generally that interested in myself, but I figured that you might want to do a bit of research. Firstly, we have New World, which could easily be the next big, big MMO just based on the resources of the developer. That developer being Amazon. Though let's not forget Star Wars The Old Republic and big money doesn't always mean that it's going to top the charts. We don't even have any footage at this stage, there was an apparent leak but most don't believe it to be genuine and it tells us very little about the game anyway. This is probably my most anticipated MMO but it just couldn't go on the list because we have no information on it apart from the fact that it's going to have a crap load of money spent on it. The other game in this category is the Magic the Gathering MMO. The project doesn't even have a name yet but Magic's set in a pretty cool universe so this one could be interesting in the future. Then we have a couple of titles being developed in the East, which as many of you know I don't really tend to focus on, but some of them do look promising. The one that I'm probably most excited about is Lost Ark. 
It's an isometric camera MMO that's currently in closed beta in the east, but the developers have stated their intention of bringing it to the west. By all reports, Lost Ark is a very feature rich game and it's polished as hell, but who knows when or if we'll even see it. The game's been anticipated by fans in the west for a long time now, so I really hope we do. This is actually another game that I have a detailed overview video on, which I'll link in the description. We also have Ascent Infinite Realm, or Air for short. This is a steampunk themed MMO currently in development that looks like it has some interesting themes. However, I do have my concerns as it looks a hell of a lot like Bless Online and we all know what happened there. Again, I've got a video on this one so check the description for that. The third and final Eastern game I want to talk to is Project TL, which stands for Project The Lineage. Yep, it's a new lineage game and for that reason alone it's probably going to have a massive audience early on. It looks like another isometric camera game and it's being developed in Unreal Engine 4 so it's likely going to look pretty incredible. Also the game said to be releasing in 2019 so that's not so far away. We also have a couple of upcoming MMOs in the sci-fi space. Firstly we have the hugely ambitious Star Citizen, a game that gained record amounts of crowdfunding but has been suffering from feature creep ever since and there's still no release date in sight as of right now. However, both the depth and scale of Star Citizen are incredible, and if you're going to shoot for incredible then you're probably going to spend a lot of time developing your game, and you're going to learn some very difficult lessons along the way. I really do hope this one works out as I know a lot of players are hugely invested both financially and emotionally. I expect it will, but I think it's going to take a long time. Secondly, we have Dual Universe, a sci-fi sandbox MMO that actually looks pretty interesting if sci-fi is your thing. Unlike Star Citizen, it looks like Dual Universe is scheduled to release at the end of 2018, so all being well, we should get our hands on this one a lot sooner. And finally, there's one more game that I want to mention that might be worth keeping an eye on, and that is Fractured MMO. The game's been built by a very small and ambitious studio, and it's got some very unique ways of dealing with PvP and character progression in particular. And that brings us to the end of our list. I hope you enjoyed it and don't forget to check out the other videos on my channel for further details on many of the games listed. Before we finish up, I want to thank Mastrop for sponsoring this video. Knowing that I use and love the Sennheiser Game 1 headset, Mastrop decided to send me their very own Sennheiser PC37X to try out. I've been using the headset for the last couple of weeks and I've been massively impressed with the quality of the audio as well as how comfortable they are to wear. Personally, I game and edit for sometimes 12 hours a day and these headphones are both immersive and comfortable for the duration and they look pretty awesome too. If you're in the market for a new gaming headset then you should go and check out the reviews on Mastrop and I'll put a link in the description down below. Anyway, thanks for watching the video, take care of yourself and I look forward to seeing you next time.